Astro Club Ferguson College welcomes everyone to the fourth day of week long celebration on Astronomy Day. Our theme for today's topic is optical astronomy and we will be looking at one of the most common method of astronomy used up to this day. We will be going through beginning of astronomy, telescopes and their types, their mounts, their properties and detectors, telescopes in the sky and finally we will learn a bit about the future of optical astronomy. And spoiler alert, the future is amazing. Isn't it satisfying to watch these actual images of the heavenly bodies that are there in the universe taken by our most powerful telescopes? While our eyes can only see tiny dots in the night sky, with the help of new developments in astronomy, we have successfully captured these incredible images. However, not all the images that you see are from optical telescopes. Some of them are a mixture of radio, X-ray and infrared data as well. But that's a topic for a whole other talk. As Carl Sagan said, we are all descendants of astronomers. Astronomy, the study of the universe is said to be the oldest of the sciences. Ancient civilizations must have observed heavenly events, such as the passage of days and nights and the phases of the moon. They saw that the cycle of season was related to the position of sun in the sky and length of the day. In ancient times, our survival depended on how we read the stars in order to predict coming of winter and migration of wild herds. First nomads used the stars for navigating, the direction in their travels. The ancient observers grouped together some stars into constellation, and often these were given names derived from imaginary pictures of creatures which aligned with the constellations. Now let us talk a bit about history. I know this is not a history talk, but knowing a bit about the history of any field is important. Now if we talk about optical astronomy, our earliest telescopes were small and had very small light collecting areas and they looked something like this. I know you were expecting an actual small telescope but our eyes are a type of telescope as well. It works just like every other telescope. It collects light and converges it on a detector. But it has very small magnification and collecting power and thus we need an external instrument like the one Galileo used in 16th century. You might think that the purpose of a telescope is to magnify small objects so that we can see them better. But that is not the case. In general terms, the purpose of a telescope is to make things easier to see, to make invisible visible, and to make the things that are already visible a bit clearer. Think of it as a bucket of rain. The bigger the bucket, the more rain you collect. In a telescope, the bucket is the optical device like a lens or mirror that collects light. For a better analogy, you can think of a bucket which has a funnel at the bottom. All the light collected by a lens or mirror is concentrated and focused and sent to the detectors. And if you look directly through a telescope, that detector is our eye. There are many varieties of telescopes out there. There are small telescopes that we can purchase, the ones at the large observatories. And there are also space-based telescopes. We categorize telescopes depending upon the type of optical device used. The first type is a refractor type telescope and they have two lenses. The main lens that collects the light is called objective lens and the other lens is called eyepiece. These telescopes were widely used in olden times, but they suffer from chromatic aberration. That is, different wavelengths of light are bent differently by the lens and thus we can see colors separated at the edges of the object. So to correct this, reflector type telescopes are made. As the name suggests, they have a reflecting surface that reflects the light and thus no chromatic aberration. In addition to the reflectors, they are quite small as compared to refractors. And the last type is compound or catadioptric, which has a system of mirror and lens. They have even more compact than reflectors and refractor types. These telescopes, they need to be mounted on something so that they can easily be moved. There are mainly two types of mount. First one is the altitude azimuth mount. And in this, you can adjust how high a star is. The height of a star from the horizon is its altitude. We can also adjust the azimuth, which is the angle it makes with the north pole in the clockwise direction. These mounts are fairly easy to use, but 
if you want to track a star throughout the night it becomes difficult because the star's altitude and azimuth both keeps on changing so that's why another type of mount was made and it is called equatorial mount the polar axis of an equatorial mounted scope must be aligned with the north celestial pole which is a point in the sky around which all the other stars appear to rotate when the telescope's polar axis is aligned with the celestial pole it will be parallel to earth's rotation axis now the sky's motion from east to west can be followed easily by turning the polar axis thus only one motion is needed to track a star's motion across the sky and that makes it suitable for astronomical observations whenever someone talks about astronomy there is always a mention of electromagnetic spectrum and i will not break that tradition optical region of the electromagnetic spectrum is basically what our eyes can see and it is a very narrow band ranging from approximately 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers and for majority of human history that is all we had for better knowledge of optical astronomy there are few terms which one should be familiar with and there is a high chance that you would have heard of these two terms magnification and resolution this is our moon through a telescope the crown of night sky when we talk about magnification we mean how much we can zoom into it theoretically there is no limit on how much we can zoom but if you zoom too much you can start losing details and two objects very close to each other seems as a single object and that is because it cannot resolve two objects close together at night if we see a car approaching us we only see a single light source but as it comes near to us that single light source resolves into two different headlights resolution is directly dependent on the diameter of the telescope and with the telescopes of larger diameter one can clearly see the difference in resolution of this image in fact with larger telescopes we have found many binary or two star systems which were initially cataloged as a single star system whatever light that converges from a telescope needs to be detected without a detector it serves no purpose and in the list of detectors the first one is our eyes our eyes are both a telescope and a detector image converged by our eye lens is formed on the retina which is our natural detector and it sends a signal to our brain but you cannot store something that you see and thus other instruments were created one of the early detector was a photomultiplier tube it is a type of detector that changes photons into electrons so that they can be easily de detected and they are called photomultiplier tubes because they amplify the electrons next is a photographic plate which is a plate that is sensitive to light and light is allowed to fall on it until an image is formed these were particularly useful but a small mistake and the entire plate would become useless nowadays we used charged couple detectors or ccd and cmos it stands for complementary metal oxide semiconductors the way ccd works is that there are three different sensors for red green and blue called pixels and whatever light falls on these sensors it gets captured and it is given out one column at a time and thus it takes a longer time to process but it has very good resolution but one downside of this is that if a sensor is overexposed that entire column will become overexposed this is called the smearing effect to avoid this we use cmos because in cmos each pixel works independently and they are much faster than ccd but they have lower resolution there are lots of powerful telescopes on earth but so is the atmosphere and because of it we get a lot of disturbances and astronomers would want nothing but to remove the atmosphere but that is very unlikely so we have to work around it and set up observatories in space free from these disturbances space telescopes have much better resolution than any telescopes on earth 
even if they are much smaller in diameter. First name that comes in mind when someone talks about a space telescope is the Hubble Space Telescope. This is a 3D model of it and you can see its various parts as I move around. Hubble is an upgradable space-based telescope orbiting at about 600 kilometers above the surface of the Earth and it takes about 97 minutes to complete each orbit. It observes our universe in the UV, optical and the infrared regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Despite Hubble's relatively modest diameter of 2.4 meters, it is well able to compete with ground-based telescopes, which has mirrors 10 times larger in collecting area. Hubble is a live satellite, about 16 meters long or the size of a small bus. It contains over 3000 sensors, which are necessary because there is no one in space to operate it manually. Hubble was launched in 1990 with expected life of 15 years, but even after more than 30 years, it is still revealing mysteries of the universe. And the next in line is Hubble Space Telescope's much publicized successor, the James Webb Space Telescope. With a diameter of 6.5 meters compared to Hubble's 2.4, it has over five times more Hubble's collecting area. As the largest telescope ever scheduled for launch, the only way to fit it into a rocket is to fold it. Origami style. Webb will begin unfolding its 18 hexagonal mirrors on its journey about a million miles away. It will continue unfolding, cooling, and testing for another five months before opening its camera to the sky. Webb's larger mirror allows it to detect objects 16 times fainter than Hubble. This will provide a picture of the universe of the first stars and galaxies in our universe. Building a space telescope might sound cool, but it is very costly to send a large mirror telescope in space. So that means you cannot make more space telescopes and on Earth you are stuck with this type of distortion. Images are very fuzzy, unstable and not well resolved. So the only way to overcome this is if we can somehow compensate for the distortion and we can do this using a technique called adaptive optics. The most powerful telescopes on earth have no better spatial resolution than a typical backyard telescope. Thanks to the atmosphere, as far as the 1950s, engineers proposed that if you could somehow deform the mirrors of a telescope in real time to account for the atmospheric turbulences, you should be able to remove its distortions. And in 1960s and 70s, the US military developed its first adaptive optic system. The way this works is first, we select a bright star in the region we want to point our telescopes. This is called a guide star. Light from the guide star passes through the telescope's optics and a special camera called a wavefront sensor measures the guide star's distortions hundreds or even thousands of times a second. That is why the guide star has to be bright. If it's too faint, you can't see it changing quickly enough to provide any data. A computer uses this information to create an opposite wavefront, which is applied to a deformable mirror. This mirror consists of a very thin layer of flexible metal with hundreds of small magnets attached to the back. These magnets move instantly up and down so that the surface of the mirror is transformed in real time. The mirror now has a shape of opposite wavefront. So the light wave is evened out after it strikes the surface and you can see a clear image and the results are phenomenal. We not only have a better resolution, but also we can actually tell the difference between a star and a galaxy from right here on Earth. So what do you do if there isn't a bright star near the object you want to photograph? Simple, just create an artificial guide star. Astronomers 
shoot a powerful laser into the sky, usually a sodium laser. And when the laser reaches the altitude of 90 to 100 kilometers, the frequency of the beam stimulates particles, causing them to glow and that acts as a fake star, which can be used as a reference to calculate the distortion. Keck observatories have been using adaptive optics for a long time now. The very large telescopes, four 8.4 meter telescopes, fire four separate lasers into space, giving it four artificial guide stars. This new mode allows the telescope to see a region just 7.5 arc second across. From this image, you can't identify this to be a star or a nebula or a galaxy. But with the new narrow field view of very large telescope, it becomes much sharper and the surface features are visible. To celebrate the narrow field mode, Neptune was chosen as one of its targets. Neptune is just 2.4 arc seconds across at its closest. Compare this with the best image ever taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And here is a photo of Neptune taken by Voyager 2. This one is better, but Voyager 2 was only 7 million kilometers away from the planet. So that's not exactly fair. Similar to adaptive optics, we also have active optics. But this is not used for atmospheric distortions, but for the distortions due to weight of large mirrors. Actuators correct the deformation and we get a sharp focus. We are now at the point where the most powerful ground-based telescopes have matched and even exceeded the capacity of space telescopes. And the best is yet to come. The future of optical astronomy is even more interesting. Starting with the Giant Magellan Telescope or GMT. It is the part of next generation of extremely large telescopes that are currently under development. When it begins operating in 2023, it will be the largest telescope we have ever constructed and it will be the first to image Earth-like planets around distant stars. GMT will take a giant leap forward by combining seven of the giant mirrors to create an enormous 25 meter mirror that is more than double the size of largest telescope in the world today. It will be equipped with adaptive optics and along with six laser guided stars, GMT will be able to investigate questions that astronomers have been asking for a long time, which is, are we alone? GMT will be able to detect planets that are more than 1 million times fainter than their host stars. Next in line is a 30 meter telescope, which is called 30 meter telescope. And it will be the largest telescope ever built in the Northern Hemisphere. To build mirrors larger than 8 meters across, multiple mirrors are bought together to act as a giant mirror. But TMT will combine four 92 segments to form a giant mirror 30 meters in diameter. Each mirror is 1.4 meter across, but only 45 millimeters thick. The telescope will be protected by a special enclosure called Calatodome. This design was chosen to reduce construction cost as well as to keep the overall footprint of the telescope as small as possible. At night, the enclosure pivots to allow the telescope to point anywhere in the sky. This project is a result of an international partnership between India, Canada, China, Japan and institutes from USA and it is expected to see light in 2027. As the name suggests, the extremely large telescope will be the largest optical and infrared telescope in the world, producing images six times sharper than those from Hubble Space Telescope. The primary mirror will be 39.3 meters wide and it will consist of 798 hexagonal segments. Each segment is about 1.4 meters across, but it is only 50 millimeters thick. That makes the mirror lightweight and easy to produce. The sensitivity of this camera will be compared to James Webb Space Telescope, but will have six times the resolution. 
it will be the most advanced telescope ever built with eight laser guided stars. Its adaptive optics will be far more superior than any other telescope. But out of these new generation telescopes, the most interesting one is the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. Its primary mirror spans 8.4 meters, which is only three and a half times larger than Hubble. But LSST's secret lies not much in the size, but its incredible speed. LSST will scan the whole southern sky every few nights. It will see how things in our universe move and changes over days, months and years. Every night for 10 years, it will take 1000 pairs of exposure and store 15 terabytes of data. We will be able to track the motion of rogue high velocity stars whistling through our galaxy. We'll spot countless fast moving objects in our own solar system, including the potential hazardous asteroids that could impact the Earth one day. Looking at these enormous telescopes and advancements, a question arises. What is the need of all this? What is the use of it? Astronomy is useful because it raises us above ourselves. It is useful because it is grand. It shows us how small a man's body is, yet how great his mind is. As Carl Sagan said, we began as wanderers and we are wanderers still. We have lingered long enough on the shores of the cosmic oceans. We are ready at last to set the sails for the stars. The future holds amazing surprises for us. We are at a turning point now where the scientists are going to be making enormous advancements thanks to the both ground and space observatories. Instead of being trapped under the blanket of Earth's atmosphere, astronomers have found a way to compensate for it, to ignore it. That's my time. Like, share and subscribe to get notification for the next video and join the telegram group for more updates. Link in the description.